Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to another edition of Beverly's Times Past. Uh, my name is Ed Josephs, and about three years ago, we endeavored to begin a series of programs uh, on the history of the Beverly Airport, which uh, had its beginning back in the 1927-28 period of time. And along with our guest Paul Lockham of those two programs three years ago, we took you through the 27-28 period all the way up to 1941, beginning of World War II. And this evening, we'd like to extend our series through the war years from 1942 through 1945 and talk about the uh, Beverly Airport as it was back then under the control of the uh, United States Navy at that particular time. And with us this evening is our old friend, Mr. Paul Lockham, mm -hmm. uh, a native of Beverly, uh, grew up, went to the Beverly schools, attended Beverly High School, and he is uh, an authority, I should say, on, on the uh, history of the airport. He has spent most of his adult life collecting miscellaneous information, and putting everything together with pictures and data, and done just a tremendous job uh, portraying the history of our illustrious airport. And our other guest this evening comes from Salem, Mr. Dave Goggin. He is a retired deputy fire chief of the Salem Fire Department. And it turns out that he was stationed at Beverly Airport right. late 1944 through the 45 period as a seaman first class in the United States Navy. And Dave will have some insights uh, to tell us a little bit later on in our program concerning the Navy's role up at the airport in uh, 44 and 45. And as custom here, our co-host for the evening, Mr. Richard Sims, a fellow who needs no introduction these days, curator of the Walker Collection at the Beverly Historical Society, and uh, Dick has been helping us out here with times past now for the past three, three or four years. Welcome, Dick, to you. Thank you. And we thought we'd start with a brief review, perhaps a four or five minute review of programs one and two with you and Paul you might like to bring us up to speed as to where we are as we begin 1942, Dick. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Nice to have you with us. Um, Thank you. Paul, in the earlier programs on World War II, uh, we started out by learning that uh, the airport as we know it now was nothing but a grass field which came from two neighboring farms and, and was started uh, in, what, 1927 or 28 by the Beverly Aero Club. Perhaps mm -hmm. you could take it from there and give us a quick chronology where it went until the World War II period. All right. The, um, the Beverly Aero Club members uh, first uh, met around September of 1927, but the Aero Club itself uh, was formed 
in March of 1928. And the Beverly Chamber of Commerce members uh, were playing uh, golf and noticed a plane had crash landed, uh, made a forced landing on the golf course, and they thought maybe maybe uh, an, an airport some place in the city ought to be um, built. And it just so happens you had these two groups uh, taking an interest in starting uh, uh, aviation activity in Beverly. And uh, once the Beverly Chamber of Commerce heard about the aero club farming, that they uh, backed them and uh, gave them assistance. And finally, the meetings were held right in the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, quarters during the, during the early formative stages of the Beverly Aero Club, which formed in 1928. Uh, so uh, later on in June of 1928, um, the city itself took over the lease from the Beverly Aero Club, and it became a Beverly Municipal mm -hmm. Airport. Uh, then uh, Beverly Aero Club contracted North Shore Airways, a group of uh, fellows uh, who uh, were meeting in the Boston area, who were more familiar with uh, aviation activities and organizing aviation operations. And they contracted them to be a fixed base operator at the airport. And they, that activity lasted about uh, a year, uh, from 1929 in August to about August of 1930. And uh, I guess they decided that, that uh, they no longer wanted this group at the airport, and there must have been some kind of friction or whatever. And the members of the Air Club itself uh, took over as the fixed-based operator. Uh, with a, under the leadership of Elton McNeil, and uh, and then uh, a couple of years later, Larry Thompson took over uh, through the remainder of the 1930s. In the late 1930s and 1938, uh, Larry Thompson was commissioned a special airmail pilot, and he flew the first airmail to Boston in a biplane. Um, the first commercial operation occurred at the airport in 1940, formed by North Shore Airways, unrelated to the original North Shore Airways, which uh, started in 1929. And this was under the leadership of Francis Chalifo. And uh, with that activity at the airport now that they, they've decided that they ought to appoint a, an airport manager to oversee uh, the operations where it was getting more uh, more complex and more activity at the airport. So that about covers very briefly the, uh, the history through the 1930s. Very good, uh, Paul. This, mm -hmm. of course, was featured in our first two programs, Dick, mm -hmm. one and two which it's hard to believe is uh, three three years ago that we aired the first two That's parts right. of our series That's here. That's right. And uh, we're very fortunate indeed to have uh, Paul Locker and uh, Dave Goggin to uh, be with us this evening to uh, expound on the World War II era of the airport. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, why don't we get right into it now and we'll move mm -hmm. right yes. along mm -hmm. as rapidly as we can and we have our first photograph up on the screen. Tell us what we're looking at. Well, you're looking at a lineup of the instructors and student pilots uh, taking part in the civil, yeah, the civil pilot training program, which was the first military activity occurring at the airport, which started in 1940. This program occurred throughout the country. It was strictly a Navy program as opposed to an Army Air Force program to, to train student pilots who were going to local colleges. Uh, they trained them as far as primary training was concerned. Then they went on to advanced training in, in other bases. So they were training in uh, Piper Cubs, maybe a half dozen or so of them that they had at the airport uh, starting in 1940, right up to the, just after Pearl Harbor. 
So they were anticipating, as it were, perhaps some trouble brewing. Oh, yes. And yes. trying to mm -hmm. Dave, uh, prepare mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, as much as possible. And North Shore Airways uh, ran the program along with uh, the backing of the Navy. Okay. Any names in this picture, Paul, that we could Well, there was a John Jorgensen from Beverly. Okay. He may be the third from the left. I'm oh. not positive. I've, I've seen other photos of him, and mm -hmm. that looks sort of like him. We, have, we have another picture of Mr. <coughs> Jorgensen that we're showing now on the screen. So if it is indeed him, mm -hmm. why, we're, mm -hmm. we're on target there. Okay. Okay, can we move to the next uh, photograph yeah. here? Well, I, I could say, though, first that uh, after December 7, this activity uh, moved from the airport uh, to Claremont, New Hampshire and it became what they call the Navy V-5 training program. So there was no more of that sort of thing then after that point? No, there was no, there was not. Okay, next uh, uh, picture up photo, March <coughs> 1941, I believe, Paul. Yes, uh, also with the war clouds brewing, they uh, started to uh, build the first paved runway at the airport. Uh, the Northwest Southeast Runway, starting in 19 March of 41, built under the Defense Landing Areas Program. Uh, it was paid by the CAA and constructed by the WPA on city purchased land. Um, this runway was uh, completed in August of 41, and they had a special rededication air show August 10, 1941. Now this runway is runway, what they call now runway 1634. Uh, that was the first runway completed. Okay, so we begin to see uh, the difference between a real country mm. kind of uh, mm. airport up there with a, mm. with a uh, perhaps dirt or cinder or whatever they had for the runway mm. in those days. Now we have a paved, smooth, uh, more or less modern runway up there. Yes. At this point in time. In fact, first. it was the longest runway in New England, longer than yeah. even Logan Airports at that time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, uh, okay. Can we can we move along now to the yeah. next picture, perhaps? Okay. <coughs> and while I am describing this, the North Shore Airways um, built a new hangar of their their own, uh, shown at the uh, right center of the photograph uh, of the of the runway. Okay, very good. Yeah. And it looks like a big aircraft carrier, doesn't it, Richard? Mm -hmm. Certainly in that photo mm -hmm. it does, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, next photo, Paul. And in October 41, uh, they added a second runway, the north-south runway, which is 3,500 feet long, again paid by, by the CAA on city purchased land, and at the same time, a, uh, the, the second hangar of uh, uh, North Shore Airways was completed. So on the map, um, the new runway would be runway 220, which is it's called today. And the second hangar would be this one here, this being the first hangar, and the operations building, of course, next to it. Okay. They still stand mm -hmm. today. Yeah, they still stand That's today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess that we could gather that much of the major a change in construction did take place as a result of the war. Oh, no question. As we mm. know the airport today up there. Absolutely. That, that's yeah. true. That's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, Paul, let's move right along now. Next picture, perhaps. Well, all right. Uh, I had noticed in early 42 a olive drab C-47 uh, making approaches to the airport over the Rawside area over a two or three day period. And then years later I had discovered that Northeast Airlines uh, pilots were flying an Air Force uh, C-47 with Northeast Airlines markings on it. And I'm not positive, but it's very possible that I was looking at one of those uh, C-47s, or, or, or maybe there was only one, it could be the one, only C-47, OD, Olive Drab. And where Francis Chalifo, who was the um, president of North Shore Airways, which later became Eastern Aviation, uh, where he was a pilot of Northeast, it seemed very possible 
that he arranged for this DC-3 to come into the airport and possibly fly some of the equipment uh, that the CPT program was using up to uh, Claremont, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. It's very possible. I I'm only guessing at that. But, sure, sure. Uh, and then a little later in February 42, uh, Eastern Aviation, un also under Francis Chalifaux, organized a, a CAP wing to uh, patrol the coast uh, uh, for submarines, and uh, can you tell us what the letter CAP stood for, Paul? Well, Civil Air Patrol. Okay. That was organized just after um, December seventh, after Pearl Harbor. Okay. It, it was a, a division of the uh, U.S. Army Air Force. Already. And there were a number of them uh, programs around. Right. Now, I can imagine, uh, Dave and, and Dick, that the, as soon as Pearl Harbor occurred, and we know that the civilian people, flyers, were asked no longer to use the, the uh, airport, there must have been a, a feeling of uh, grimness, perhaps, uh, that, uh, that uh, abound, uh, because here we have this threat coming at us from, from Germany, mm -hmm. and then, of course, Japan, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, Beverly Airport is closed. Uh, there are no civilians uh, welcome any longer. In fact, uh, Dave, did they not have to go 50 miles or so inland now to uh, go yes. to an airplane? As far as I know, they had to keep away from the coast because of the fear of infiltration by saboteurs and so forth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I guess my point is after having built the airport kind of like on a private industry basis to have the military come in, it must have mm. caused them may have caused a few ill feelings yeah. along the way. They must have really... Some of the, some of the old timers up there who were yeah. in on it way back in 27 mm -hmm. or 28, being I'm sure. Pushed out of oh, the, right. yeah. Being pushed out of Being pushed out completely. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. Okay, let's mm -hmm. move right along. Yeah. What's up next, Paul? Uh, well, as a lot of people may not know, uh, the airport is called Mountain Field, but it's not referred to that very often nowadays. But uh, in June of... Uh, 42, uh, it was officially named Mountain Field in honor of uh, John W. Mountain, Jr. He it was the first uh, uh, Army Air Force cadet from Beverly to graduate from uh, cadet training. Uh, he was a basketball star in both the uh, uh, high school and in the uh, city league, uh, which used to meet down at the Y. Uh, he uh, worked for the uh, uh, United Shoe. Uh, he lived on Mill Street down in the Gloucester Crossing area. Uh, he was killed in a crash uh, up in uh, Alaska flying a P-40 or some fighter up and assimilated attacks uh, against a bomber. He collided with the bomber and uh, somehow was thrown clear of the plane, uh, most likely, because they found the wreckage of the plane, but not the pilot. Never, they had never found him uh, up to this day. Oh. And um, It's kind of a shame that yes. uh, the, the field, of course, is the John Mountain field, but when you go up there today, you could just barely There's see a, a little tiny sign, sign. That, That's right. that's up there. It's a shame right, that, that right. at this period mm. of time of the 50th anniversary that, that there hasn't been a rededication of the airport in his name. Yeah. with a much bigger plaque. Yeah. Maybe yeah, if somebody's should. watching this program tonight, mm -hmm. uh, that will put the bug in somebody's ear that John Mountain Field uh, should be re-recognized and perhaps uh, mm -hmm. a suitable monument put there during this, this uh, end of the World War II 50th anniversary period. Good idea. Where, this, where you're commemorating mm -hmm. the war Absolutely. should be done at this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I see, Paul, by our notes here, that in December of 42, the Navy officially took over the, uh, the field. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, throughout 42, uh, there was not much activity other than the Civil Air Patrol uh, act operations there. But in December of 42, the Navy took the field over as a defense landing field. Uh, it was leased from the city of Beverly. And uh, US, U.S. Coast Guard uh, aircraft from Salem started operating out of there once it became a defense landing field. And uh, 
They were flying uh, the Grumman JRF Goose amphibians and the J4F amphibians uh, into there. Uh, basically because uh, at that time the, the Salem Harbor uh, was iced over and of course they couldn't land the, with a flying boat hulls. Also uh, to, to save on stress of water landings um, they uh, were using the, uh, the Beverly Airport instead of the uh, yeah. Salem Harbor. Yeah. And in 1943 uh, this, the operation of the Coast Guard um, officially became a detachment uh, to Salem uh, under the uh, command of uh, John W. McIntosh, uh, who answered to the uh, commander at the uh, Salem Air Station. Okay. <coughs> mm -hmm. Dave, before, while, while we're on the subject of these uh, Coast Guard planes landing, what, what was the, the reason that they preferred to land up at Beverly Airport? You were telling us earlier. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, besides the fact that the uh, harbor was frozen over during the winter months, uh, the problem existed whereby after a number of landings, mm. and I can't give you an exact number, but the hull would take such a beating that they would have to actually take the plane in and redo the hull. Okay. So under the circumstances, mm. the <coughs> planes that were capable of water and land capabilities, mm. uh, they would end up landing over here and uh, on the wheels uh, they have no problem replacing them every so often whereas the hull was a major factor involved yeah. in uh, re recapping the plane. Right. right. Good. That's good to clear that up. Mm -hmm. We'll mm -hmm. get more into that a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. Okay Paul, let's move along here. We're into 1943 now, correct? Yes. Uh, besides the uh, Coast Guard operation there, the, uh, the Navy started uh, flying in and out of there, with, uh, starting with the Grumman Avenger torpedo bombers. Um, they would be from uh, Quonset Point or other uh, naval air stations in the 1st Naval District, and they were mostly practicing simulated carrier landings. Um, and this uh, particular plane, though, was seen at the airport the longest of any. Uh, I recall seeing them right up till the end of 1945. Um, they were making uh, carrier landings uh, on any of the runways depending on the wind direction, uh, simulating carrier landing and takeoffs. Okay, now what, what mm -hmm. plane are we looking at here, Paul? Is that, this? this is the, the Grumman Avenger, TBF. Okay. Uh, also, General Motors made uh, these aircraft too, and they call TBMs, but they're they're one in the same aircraft. All That's right. the same plane that uh, President Bush was flying. That yes. type of aircraft. Is that correct? That's right. <coughs> now, another type of training they did there at the airport was called glide bombing training. Uh, besides the the uh, simulating of the takeoff and landings, uh, a couple of occasions I had noticed these Avengers making these screaming dives maybe at a 45 degree angle. At first I thought it was a fighter plane because they had, they had the engines turned up full RPM and they were screaming away and it turned out to be uh, the Avengers. And most likely they were practicing the, uh, they call glide bombing as opposed to dive bombing. Uh, the dive bombing is more of a straight in, a straight in mm -hmm. uh, whereas this was uh, at a less of a uh, angle. Would that skip the bombs across well, the water? Well, not really. It was, it was really, it was really regular bombing, but it was called glide bombing, and uh, it would naturally the tra trajectory of the bomb would follow the plane, right, and into it, the forty-five degree, and angle. it wouldn't skip. It would probably just okay. hit whatever it hit. No, Paul, um, you were you were playing hooky from the outside school observing when I school. saw that. No, I huh. I was probably up in the Green Hi Greens Hill, up in the back of where I lived there. I I used to uh, be able to observe them from that vantage point quite yeah. often. Very good. Let's move on. Paul, yeah, if we can here. <laughs> right. I must have shook the neighbors up, Ted, a little bit. I should, all that I should going say. On. I should say. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> Although, Dave, as we pointed out uh, in our pre-program discussion. 
There wasn't much of a neighborhood up in those uh, in that neck of the woods. No, the, uh, the, all the projects came after World War mm. II. Pre uh, it was vacant land all around, primarily. <coughs> farming areas and uh, some cottages that people had uh, their land up there. But the real development came after World War II. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Okay, Paul, let's go, go right ahead here. All right. Well, in the February 43, they decided to abolish the uh, airport manager's post. Uh, over the mayor's veto, the uh, Board of Aldermen didn't think he, he was needed any longer. Uh, the mayor thought uh, really that he ought to be overseeing some of the construction going on up there, but I guess the Board of Aldermen thought otherwise. Yeah, we're talking Mayor Chick McLean, though. No? Chick, yes, yeah. right, the mayor, Daniel okay. McLean. Uh, in May of 43, uh, the airport was approved uh, as a naval auxiliary air facility under Squanum. Uh, although it continued to be uh, a reliever base for the other uh, air stations in the uh, First Naval District, including Quonset Point. Uh, uh, the next month, uh, June or July, um, they started constructing the facilities of the Naval uh, Air Facility, NAAF, uh, constructing the, the mess hall and barracks. We're seeing some of these pictures now as you're um, talking about them, are we? Um, a little later on, uh, I think I'll be covering them in, okay. in photographs. All right. Um, the control tower they built, um, they converted the old Beverly Aero Club hangar to a garage and storage. And um, uh, according to David here, uh, they used to store uh, some of the crash trucks there overnight, and it was also used as a machine shop and maintenance uh, building. Okay, uh, Paul, now we're back up, uh, we're up to September of 1943, and we're looking at the east end of uh, the runway up at Beverly Airport. Yeah. East Westwood. Yeah, yeah right. Say. In September 43, the, the third and final runway was completed. That's the 5,000 foot runway, uh, runway 927 uh, on the bottom. Ready? Photo. Part of the picture. Uh, it was completed in 1944, and at the same time, they extended the north end of, of uh, 3416. They extended this another uh, 600 or so feet. So it turned out to be uh, 4,600 feet or so when it was completed. Uh, paid by the CAA again on the city land. Uh, during the spring of 44, um, uh, the entrance road right here was straightened and paved. Previous to that, it was a, just a dirt winding road uh, which I remember traveling into the airport on uh, during the 30s. Okay. And uh, can we say a word about the facilities up there now before we get Dave to come in on the, on our conversation? Because we have a yeah, slew yeah. of pictures here that yeah. relate to yeah, the right. facilities. If if we could talk about the the uh, NAAF Naval Auxiliary Air Facility, and then I'll describe the, the facilities. Sure. Uh, okay. Um, we have a, a shot here of a. Commander Plank uh, with officers and enlisted men. Um, this officially began in October 43, although the NAAF was established in May. The reason why it wasn't uh, um, in operation until October was because of uh, the uh, facilities being completed. Mm -hmm. And um, all this was uh, uh, established. Uh, from the efforts of Captain Victor D. Herbster, who was a district aviation officer of the 1st Naval District, a sub-commander of the uh, Northern Group Eastern Sea Frontier. This lasted throughout the war, um, and it was just established just uh, after VJ Day, or in September of 45. Uh, we have a series of pictures showing the Naval Auxiliary Air Facility. Um, showing Eastern Aviation Hangar and the at Large uh, Operations Building um, with a new tower uh, with a, a Grumman JRF uh, to the right of the hangar. The old Beverly Aero Club Hangar um, sh 
shown uh, along with the uh, mess hall and barracks building. A shot of the sick bay, uh, shots in the mess hall, a, a dog mascot, uh, a light signal uh, from the control tower, and showing that the sailors relaxing uh, in uh, Okay. Uh, uh, Dave, that. this is probably, as you remember, mm -hmm. uh, the facility. Yeah, here. surely. That, you? It was there. Uh, fairly stable throughout the period that I was there, mm -hmm. and uh, of course uh, they didn't uh, change very much because it was satisfactory to whatever the needs of the Navy was at the time. Right. Now going back a bit, you, you entered the Navy at a very young and tender age of 17. Yes, uh, 17. Uh, I actually uh, joined up to uh, beat the draft, which at yeah. that time was, uh, everyone was getting ready for D-Day landings and everybody had to go to the Army at that time. Uh -huh. So. I said, uh, I'm not going to crawl through any uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. ditches yeah. and so forth. I'll join the Navy. Sure. Mm.